as Dr. Woodward mentioned, we're going to talk about the first trimester of pregnancy. And that may seem a sort of esoteric area to be talking about to a group of medical students. But in fact, those of you that go into OBGYN and emergency medicine will be looking at the first trimester of pregnancy a lot. Those of you that do family practice may well be looking at first trimester pregnancies in your office when people come to establish prenatal care. And those of you doing surgery and medicine will undoubtedly be taking care of patients who also happen to be pregnant. So the title of this talk is called First Do No Harm. And that is actually based on a paper that was published by Carol Benson and Peter Dubelay in um, Brigham and Women's. And they were very, um, motivated, shall we say, to make sure that no harm should be done to early pregnancies. I like to also think about harm being done to mothers. And remember, if you have a pregnant patient who dies, your mortality is at least 200% because you lose the mom and you lose the baby. Okay, so what are we thinking about? Um, those are royalties. Uh, if I have to explain, I get royalties from Elsevier for writing both chapters. When you think about a patient who's pregnant, one of the first things you have to establish is where is that pregnancy? And also to confirm that she is pregnant. And I'll tell you, it's not uncommon that a patient is sent for a quote unquote viability study, usually Friday afternoon at 4.30, and they had a home positive pregnancy test a week ago, two weeks ago, and they're bleeding. And so the big issue becomes, are they actually pregnant or not? And a home positive pregnancy test two weeks ago doesn't answer that question. So we want a pregnancy test on the day that we scan. And ideally, you like actually the serum test to get a quantitative beta HCG, because that helps you to figure out where in the pregnancy you should be. When we do ultrasound, we're looking to determine if the pregnancy is in the uterus or in another place in the mom, or if it's actually being passed and is a complete miscarriage. So that's these guys. And as I say, when you think about ectopic pregnancy, everyone knows about tubal ectopic, which is the commonest variety of ectopic pregnancy. But there are some ectopics that are just a little bit peculiar because they're in the uterus, but they're not in a normal spot in the uterus. You want your pregnancy to be embedded in the endometrial cavity. If it chooses to go and sit in the interstitial portion of the tube or in the cervix, or in the C-section scar, then that is an abnormal location and that is not compatible with delivery of a term baby. And it's also very dangerous for the mom, particularly those intrauterine ectopic pregnancies are dangerous because they are surrounded by myometrium or cervical stroma. And that means they can get bigger than they do when they set up home in the fallopian tube. When they're bigger, they have a bigger blood supply. So when they rupture, the bleeding can be catastrophic. Now, if you've done all these things and you have a positive pregnancy test and you've looked with ultrasound and you can't see anything, you can't assume that you are dealing with an abortion. You are actually dealing with this entity known as a PUL, which is a pregnancy of unknown location. <clears throat> that is not a diagnosis. There are many things in radiology that are observations, not diagnoses. PUL is one of those. And it's really important because we have to figure out what that PUL is going to become when it grows up, because that has implications for managing the patient. So a PUL is one that is not in the uterus, it is not in the cervix, it is not in the C-section scar, it is not in the fallopian tube. You do not see any evidence of products of conception. Why is that important? Pay attention, this may be coming up in a question later is because about half of them go away. Nobody knows where they were. Were they really, really early and they just didn't implant normally and they were resorbed? Were they pregnancies that miscarried? We'll never know. About a third of them are subsequently diagnosed as viable. And those are usually in patients who have an irregular cycle. So they have an LMP date that suggests we should be able to see a pregnancy, but in fact, they conceive later, so we can't and it is a perfectly okay pregnancy. It is just beyond the resolution of ultrasound at the time the study was performed. The really important thing is that 11%, and depending where, which paper you read in the literature, sometimes this goes up to about 15%, but a sizable proportion of pregnancies of unknown location are finally diagnosed as ectopic pregnancy. 
And I cannot overstep the importance of that. If you have a pregnancy of unknown location and you say to that patient, well, you know, good luck with that, we'll see you around. And she goes home and has a ruptured ectopic later, she can bleed to death. And I always tell people that we had a very sad case here a long time ago now, but a pathology resident at our hospital left his pregnant wife at home on the sofa feeling mildly nauseous and just not very good. She was about six weeks pregnant. They thought this is normal early pregnancy nausea. He came home and found her dead and she had bled to death on her sofa from a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So it is something that you must take incredibly seriously. All right, what do we do with people with POLs? Remember I said you can't say bye-bye, good luck with that. What we do is careful and close follow-up. And these are the people that have serial beta HCG. So you do a quantitative beta HCG the day they come in uh, the door to the emergency room or to your office, and you follow it in 48 hours. If the beta HCG is decreasing, the assumption is it's a failed pregnancy and it'll be one of that 50 some percent that resolve and no one will ever know where they were. If the beta HCG increases, then the question becomes, is it in the uterus, in a normal location, or is it an ectopic pregnancy? And then we do ultrasound. And so the GYN residents have a list of patients that they refer to as the ectopic watch list. And these women are having serial beta HCGs and serial ultrasounds so that we can determine where the pregnancy is. Now, moving on from that to what a normal pregnancy looks like, um, if you think about it, you take two cells. You take an ovum from the mom and a spermatozoa from the dad, and out of those two cells, you have to build an entire human being. So it's actually in some ways amazing that it ever goes right. But what does happen is the sperm fertilizes the ovum in the tube, and that little fertilized ovum is called a zygote and that divides and makes a blastocyst and all sorts of other interesting things that you learned about in embryology. But eventually it swims down the tube, finds its way to the uterus and embeds into the decidualized endometrium where it's going to set up home, make a placenta and grow an embryo. This is a very early vaginal ultrasound. So that's the footprint of the transducer. This, as you can see, is all kind of grayscale stuff because this is the myometrium from here to here. This is the endometrium from here to here. This white line is the echo where the two layers of the endometrium meet. And this tiny little circular cystic looking thing, because it has no internal echoes and a bit of increase through transmission, that is the very earliest sign that we see of a gestational sac. Here is the same thing when it gets bigger. And now because it's increasing in its volume, it's actually pushing out into the space between the layers of the endometrium. So this is the endometrium that it's attached to. This is the endometrium on the opposite side of the uterus. And this thick echogenic ring is the chorionic sac, which is the early sign of the pregnancy. That is called an intrauterine sac-like structure because you cannot call it an IUP yet, all right? Now, what do we do about those things? If you have someone who comes in with a positive pregnancy test and some bleeding and you do an ultrasound and you see something in the uterus, whoops, if it is a round or oval intrauterine fluid collection and you have a positive pregnancy test, you should assume that that is a pregnancy, a gestational sac, an IUP, okay? If the patient has a positive pregnancy test, an intrauterine smooth anechoic cystic structure and no adnexal mass. This is the important thing, no adnexal mass. Then the statistical probability of an ectopic pregnancy in that situation is 0.02%. In other words, they're just doing the math to support this uh, statement. So positive pregnancy test, round or oval fluid collection in the uterus, regardless of whether it has anything in it, and nothing out in the adnexa, you're pretty much 100% that you have an IUP. That's not necessarily a viable IUP, but it is a pregnancy nonetheless. Now, here's our tiny little guy. This is, we used to call it the intradecidual sac sign. Here's the bigger sac that we used to call the double decidual sac sign because we have two echogenic rings. So we see those and no adnexal mass. We're optimistic, almost 100% of this is going to be an IUP and hopefully will result in a healthy baby. In that situation, under no circumstances should methotrexate be given. 
because methotrexate is used to treat ectopic pregnancy. It is a terrible teratogen. And if it is given to a woman who subsequently is diagnosed with an intrauterine pregnancy, then the recommendation is that pregnancy be terminated. On the other hand, if you see intrauterine fluid collections that I have colored in here, and you see how these are not round or oval, they're sort of flat and pointy edged. This is what you see when you have decidual cast or decidual bleeding. There is a gestational sac somewhere in this person, but it is not in the uterus. And so if you see a flat or pointy edged intrauterine fluid collection, you do not assume that that is an intrauterine pregnancy. And it's much more likely to be just decidual fluid seen in the setting of an ectopic pregnancy. And this paper, which is an older one, says that, look at this, 16% of patients with an ectopic pregnancy have fluid in the uterus. So just seeing fluid is not enough. You have to look at that fluid and decide if it is round or oval with a thick echogenic margin from the chorion, or if it is flat and pointy and is just blood in the cavity. This wheel is very slow. All right, here's our intrauterine sac-like structure. Our next picture is an intrauterine sac-like structure, and now it's got something in it. So this is what we call a probable intrauterine pregnancy. Once you see the sac-like structure and it's got something in it, this is the secondary yolk sac that you learned about in embryology, that takes this to a definite intrauterine pregnancy. And once again, although it is a definite intrauterine pregnancy, that does not mean it will result in the birth of a live baby, and you do not have an embryo visible yet. As the pregnancy progresses and things get further along, here is your echogenic ring, that's your chorion, which is the same thing as this guy here and this guy here. Now you have an embryo, and the embryo lives inside the amnion, which is a delicate membrane, which is inside the thick chorionic membrane. This is an embryo that measures 18.4 millimeters. So this is an embryo that should have a heartbeat. And we're going to talk about the differences between viable and non-viable pregnancies next. So there was a big consensus meeting in, uh, I think it was 2014, where the criteria to make a diagnosis of fetal demise were ironed out and solidified. And the people that did this were um, very, very concerned about the fact that the diagnosis of a dead embryo was kind of loosey-goosey and there weren't specific criteria for it, whereas when you diagnose death in a person, you know it is extremely specific and you have fixed dilated pupils, you have no respiratory effort, all of these other things that we look for before we write a death certificate for a patient. So they met and they had a group of radiologists, they had some emergency room doctors, they had obstetricians and gynecologists, and basically anyone who was interested in this concept of what is a failed or quote unquote non-viable first trimester pregnancy. And they came up with some definitions. Now this was a consensus um, statement and I was actually an observer at the meeting and I'll tell you it was interesting to see how contentious some of the discussions were before the panel reached consensus. But they decided at the end that the definition of a viable pregnancy would be a pregnancy that can potentially result in a live born baby. I personally disagree with that, but that is the definition that was decided upon and is used in the literature. What is a non-viable pregnancy? So they came up with criteria. Now, here's that little picture of the sac that I talked about before. This is the intrauterine sac-like structure, a probable intrauterine pregnancy because there's nothing in it. We measure three diameters. You go from inner to inner in orthogonal things, and you turn your transducer 90 degrees to get the third diameter, and you make the average. That is called the mean sac diameter. If the mean sac diameter is more than 25 millimeters on a vaginal scan, you have to have a live embryo. If you don't have a live embryo, the pregnancy is failed, i.e. non-viable. When you see the embryo, which was that little guy I showed you a picture of earlier, you measure it uh, in the long axis, that's called the crown rump length. If the crown rump length is more than seven millimeters and there is no cardiac activity, that is a dead embryo, a non-viable pregnancy. The only exception to the crown rump length size criterion is if you have seen cardiac activity on a scan at your office that you use to establish dates, and maybe there was a four millimeter embryo with a heartbeat, 
the patient comes back bleeding, the embryo measures five millimeters and there's no heartbeat. That is, again, a non-viable pregnancy because you had cardiac activity that has ceased. Now, in between the definitely alive and the definitely dead, there is a group of pregnancies that don't quite meet the milestones. And they are referred to as pregnancies of uncertain viability. So when I was young, when Methuselah was a boy, we used to have a rule called five alive. That's a five millimeter embryo should have a heartbeat. But this consensus committee said that that was too aggressive and they went with the seven millimeters. So now if you have an embryo that you can visualize, that you can measure, it is less than seven millimeters in length and there's no heartbeat, you have to call that uncertain viability and you have to get follow-up to basically give the pregnancy the benefit of the doubt, okay? Same way with a mean sac diameter less than that 25 millimeter threshold. And it sounds crazy, but even if the mean sac diameter is 24 millimeters and you don't see the live embryo, you cannot call it a failed pregnancy, you have to wait. And in that circumstance, we usually wait between five and seven days. And all of these wait times are built in in order to give the pregnancy the benefit of the doubt, i.e. do no harm to early embryos. Here is a pregnancy of uncertain viability situation. Here's your mean sac diameter, and it's less than the threshold, and you don't have an embryo or a yolk sac. So we know that this is a probable intrauterine pregnancy. Therefore, we know that if we wait two weeks from identifying this structure, we should see a live embryo. If we don't, we can categorically state at that point that it is a non-viable pregnancy. So if your patient is stable, then you say, okay, I see something in your uterus that is a very early pregnancy. In order to be sure that this is an okay pregnancy with a live embryo in it, we need to see you back in two weeks. Now, clearly, if the patient is bleeding and cramping in that interval time, you can scan her again. But ideally, you want to wait because you want to be definitive and say, I have a sac with nothing in it. 14 days from then, I have no live embryo. This is a non-viable pregnancy. If you get to the point where you have this little guy, which is your yolk sac, which we said went from being a probable to a definite intrauterine pregnancy, you know that you're further along in the embryological process. So you don't have to wait 14 days in this situation, you wait 11. And again, ideally wait 11 so you can be definitive with the patient and say this is either a live pregnancy, we'll measure the crown rump length and date your pregnancy from here, or there is no heartbeat, this is a failed pregnancy and you move on with your medical or surgical management of a failed pregnancy. Now, the next thing that has a potential for causing harm is incorrect dating. Because if you think about um, dates in a pregnancy and the size of the baby, how are you going to diagnose fetal growth restriction or fetal macrosomia if you don't know how big the baby should be? And you only know how big the baby should be if you know what the dates are. Um, we date by last menstrual period, and I think there is data that 40% of women in the United States don't actually know their last period. And a very large number of pregnancies in the US are also unplanned. So if people aren't planning a pregnancy, they're probably not tracking their cycles religiously. And again, they don't always know when the LMP is. We do know that in the first trimester of pregnancy, all little embryos follow the basic blueprint. It's after the first trimester pregnancy that the very tall parents will have babies with longer femur lengths. And people like me, who has a giant head, will have babies with bigger head size. So you want to try and get your ultrasound in the first trimester, correlate that with the patient's menstrual dating, and then decide if the baby is appropriate or not. The only exception to that rule is in IVF pregnancies. In IVF pregnancies, an actual fertilized embryo is placed into the, the mum's uterus. And so then it's the age of the embryo and the transfer date that are used to determine the expected date of delivery. And that is sacrosanct. We never change that with a follow-up ultrasound. Going back here, this table is incredibly complicated and I actually keep it on the wall upstairs in the OB lab because I can't keep it in my memory. But you will see the earlier you are in pregnancy, the closer everything sticks to the genetic blueprint. So if a patient is less than nine weeks pregnant by date and we measure the embryo and there's more than a five day discrepancy, we're gonna go with the ultrasound because we know that the embryo should be doing a very systematic approach to growth up until the end of the first trimester. By the time you get to the end of the first trimester and early second trimester, that difference is more than seven days. 
And if your patient wanders in in the third trimester and says, hey, I'm pregnant, and they're more than 28 weeks, well, then the dating is plus or minus 21 days. And you can imagine how three weeks makes a big difference between a potential um, iatrogenic preterm delivery or letting a pregnancy go post date and maybe having an tutor and fetal demise because the placenta has given up. And that's a whole separate lecture on fetal growth assessment. But the take home message to remember is the best time to date your pregnancies is in the first trimester. And you use these guidelines from ACOG to decide if you're going to keep the menstrual dating or you're going to change the sonographic dating. What about twins? Two for the price of one? Is that always better? Well, sometimes more is better, sometimes not. We know that all twin pregnancies are higher risk than singletons. There's an increased risk of preterm birth, increased risk of fetal anomalies, and an increased risk of maternal complications. And those apply across the board. But there are two different basic types of multiple pregnancies. One type, each baby has its own placenta. The other type, some babies share a placenta. And remember I said in the very beginning where we were looking at those gestational sacs on the ultrasound, that thick echogenic ring was the chorion. The chorion is what goes up to be the placenta. So the prognosis in multiple gestations is determined by chorionicity. And I am missing an eye on that slide. So gestational sac, barely visible chorion here, very distinctly visible chorion here, and again here. So what you want if you're having a multiple pregnancy is you want each embryo to have its own chorion so it's got its own placenta when it grows up. This is an example of dichorionic twins. And in this instance, you have one embryo, one amnion, one chorion. So everybody's got his own stuff. This is like having... Um, sharing a house, at least your roommate is in a room of his own, even if you can hear his music playing at two o'clock in the morning. And how we see that on ultrasound is we have these two big, thick, bright echogenic membranes. This is the same thing again, one thick membrane here, one thick membrane here, coming together to make what we call the um, delta sign or the twin peak. So these are dichorionic twins. Dichorionic twins can occur in two ways. One is if you actually have a dizygotic pregnancy, and that's two ova are fertilized by two separate spermatozoa. That's how you can have boy-girl twins. And that is the um, one version of dichorionic. The other is where a single ovum is fertilized by a single spermatozoa, but it divides very early in the embryological process before any cell lines are committed to making chorion. And so you get two of everything. You can't tell the difference between dizygotic and dichorionic on ultrasound until you get to where you can see the fetal sex. If you have a boy twin and a girl twin, then for sure you have dizygotic twins, but that's the only way you can tell. So this is dichorionic. That's what you want, ideally. And that's your delta sign or your twin peak sign. The other next kind is monochorionic. And that happens when you have a single zygote and it's a little bit slow to divide. And so the cells that are going to form the chorion and the placenta have already been sent off to do that task, but you're dividing early enough that you can make two amnions. So this is an amnion with an embryo in it. This is an amnion with an embryo in it. So this is having your roommate and your bedroom is divided by a curtain. You don't really have a lot of privacy, but you can't actually see them all the time. And this is a problem because these two embryos share a placenta and the blood vessels between the babies are connected and there can be all kinds of complications as a result of that. Here's the worst possible kind in terms of privacy if you're an embryo. Um, this is one amnion, sorry, one chorion, I beg your pardon. Actually, no, I'm lying, I missed a slide. Sorry, let's go back. One chorion one chorion, one amnion, two amnions. This is a video clip showing the same thing. The amnion is incredibly delicate and thin and hard to see. That is the amnion. Very hard to see, but critical to determine because this is a monochorionic but diamniotic pregnancy. The next step down from this is monochorionic and monoamniotic. 
So any monochorionic pregnancy is a problem. You have uh, sharing between the two twins and you can get twin-twin transfusion, but they are separated from each other by this thin membrane. Now you have one chorion, one amnion, two embryos. And this is a video clip through the uterus of a transvaginal ultrasound. And you can see these two little embryos are side by side, smack dab together, zipped into this small space. So there's no escaping from each other. And the problem is that they can actually swim around each other and entangle their umbilical cords. So again, just like making a determination of date is easiest in the first trimester, the determination of chorionicity and amnionicity is easiest in the first trimester. And it's critically important. So for those of you that are in family practice, if you see patients like this and you have a dichorionic twin pregnancy, that's a relatively low risk twin pregnancy and you can probably manage it yourself and deliver in your community hospital. If you get this guy, monochorionic diamniotic or this guy, monochorionic monoamniotic, they need to be referred on to MFM because they require much more aggressive uh, surveillance. Now, I did say at the beginning, didn't I, that we were going to talk about first do no, no harm to the mom as well as to the baby. And it's all fine and dandy to say, right, we have to do everything in our power to protect this little embryo because it might grow up to be a baby but you have to take care of the mom. If you don't take care of the mom, then the pregnancy is gonna suffer as well. So tubal ectopic pregnancies are the commonest variety of ectopic pregnancies. And the commonest thing that you see, especially nowadays with good ultrasound equipment, as Dr. Woodward showed you, you went from something that was barely interpretable to the beautiful kind of images that we see today. The commonest finding we see is a non-specific mass. And that's from hemorrhage. So you have a tube that, um, pregnancy that sets at home in the tube. The tubal wall is not designed to accommodate an enlarging pregnancy. So it tears and it gets some local bleeding. Plus you actually have the tissue of the early pregnancy itself, the chorion, the little embryo. So non-specific mass is seen in about 60% of patients. There's a thing called the echogenic tubal ring, which is that gestational sac that I showed you in the uterus, except it's outside of the uterus. So it's just a ring hanging out in the adnexa. And then there's a thing called the ring of fire sign. Sorry, I moved the slide again too quickly. So the ring of fire um, was when color Doppler was first applied to vaginal transducers. And you could put the transducer in the vagina, find the ovary, turn on the color, and the idea was that you would see trophoblastic flow in an ectopic pregnancy beside the ovary, i.e. in the tube, and that diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy would be ridiculously easy. The problem with that is that if that patient got pregnant because she ovulated herself, she will have a corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is what occurs after ovulation when the follicle ruptures the egg is released for fertilization. The corpus luteum stays behind in the ovary with the idea of supporting the pregnancy until the placenta is formed. So unless it was an IVF pregnancy with donor eggs, there is going to be a corpus luteum and a corpus luteum is a highly vascular structure. It's in the ovary, not beside it. But the notion that you could diagnose ectopic pregnancy with color Doppler, unfortunately was a nice idea, didn't work out so well in practice. Um, Nowadays, because people know that they're pregnant so early, um, the likelihood of seeing a live embryo, which usually means you're about six weeks from LMP, is very small. It used to be much more common in older series, but that was because people didn't even think about doing a pregnancy test until they had missed more than one menstrual cycle. Here's a picture of an ovary pathologically. This is the corpus luteum with this yellow thick wall that produces a lot of progesterone. When you look at the ovary, this is the corpus luteum on ultrasound. There's the ovary and it completely encompasses this round guy. And you can see there's plenty of blood flow in the wall. This in comparison is an example of an ectopic pregnancy. All of this is blood clot. This is your inhomogeneous mass. This guy is a little echogenic ring. And you can see, even though that actually is the pregnancy, it's not supravascular. So don't hang your hat on color Doppler and thinking that you'll be able to tell the difference on color Doppler ultrasound. Here's an example of a series of cases that were 339 um, ectopic pregnancies. And what they looked at was what they saw on ultrasound in each of them. Again, the inhomogeneous solid mass was almost 50% of their cases. 
An empty gestational sac is the same thing as that echogenic ring that I talked about, and that was in another almost 40% of cases. To see a sac with a yolk sac, in other words, going from a probable to a definite pregnancy was only 5%. A gestational sac with a live embryo, 5%, and a gestational sac with an embryo without cardiac activity, 3%. So if you see a gestational sac that contains either a yolk sac or an embryo, and it is clearly outside the uterus, then you can be very comfortable that you have an ectopic pregnancy. That's awesome, specificity 100%, but look at your sensitivity. If that's the only thing you're going to call an ectopic pregnancy, you're not going to find the majority of them. And so going back to the mathematical statistical probability that we did in the intrauterine pregnancy, you can do something similar in the setting of an ectopic pregnancy. The finding of any adnexal mass other than a simple cyst, which would essentially be a follicle, in a patient with a positive pregnancy test and nothing in the uterus is 98.9 .9 specific and 84.4% sensitive. So you have to look really carefully. And for those of you that are going to be radiologists when you grow up, you will obsess about this. Those of you that are going to do emergency room medicine will obsess about it. And those of you doing obstetrics and gynecology will obsess. These things can be incredibly subtle and incredibly complicated to look at. So here's an example. This is a uterus and there was nothing in the uterus over here. This is the ovary and there's your nice simple cyst, anechoic through transmission, sharp posterior wall. That's a follicle and that's okay. Ovaries are built to lay eggs. They make follicles. It's what they do. But look again, there's your uterus and it's definitely no signs of an intrauterine pregnancy. This is the edge of this follicle. And now what have we got? We've got something down here, an inhomogeneous adnaxal mass. That is also lovingly described by an Australian chap called George Kundas as the blob sign. And this is a blobfish. So remember, you're not looking for something that's sitting there screaming, I'm a pregnancy, I have a chorion, I have a yolk sac, I have an embryo. You're looking for an inhomogeneous, ugly looking blob out in the adnexa. Here's the other sign, which is the echogenic ring. And George Condes decided that that was rather boring and he was going to call it the bagel sign. So here again, we have a sweep through the adnexa. The ovary is coming up right there. Looks like a chocolate chip cookie full of little follicles. This is your bagel sitting separate from the ovary. And note that the uterus isn't even in this picture because we're way out looking at the adnexa. So there is a still image, there is your adnexal ring, it's beside the ovary, it does have some blood flow, and this is the equivalent to the thing we saw in the uterus as a probable IUP with thick chorionic membrane, but nothing inside. You have the blob and the bagel signs. The corpus luteum, like I said, if the person ovulated herself, then there will be a corpus luteum in the ovary, which is this, with the ovary coming up around it in a kind of a claw sign. You'll see that there's echogenic fluid here. And echogenic fluid is particulate fluid. So that has um, either white cells or red cells in it. And a corpus luteum can rupture, so you can have blood in the pelvis and an adnexal mass, and it not be an ectopic pregnancy. You have to remember that as well. Over here, what we're doing is we're using the transducer to push on the ovary and see how it separates from this blob thing over here. So that's an ovary. This is an inhomogeneous adnexal mass, AKA the blob sign, also, i.e. an ectopic pregnancy. Now, one thing that comes up a lot, especially with my residents, is what about the quantitative beta HCG? This is an intraoperative um, photo that Jessica Pittman sent me years ago. This is a ruptured tube with hemorrhage. And this is actually the intact gestational sac with about a seven week embryo in it that was literally falling out of the tube as they pulled tissues out of the way. And this fell down into the cul-de-sac. Um, we used to have a thing called a discriminatory beta HCG. And again, back in the day when I was young, the notion was that if your beta HCG was 2000 and you did not have a pregnancy in the uterus, you had to have either an ectopic pregnancy or have had a miscarriage and your beta HCG was on its way down from a previously higher level. When they had the consensus meeting about the determination of what was viable and not viable, 
um, they quoted a lot of literature and there was a paper from the UK where they looked at a bunch of pregnancies where uh, pregnancy was not seen at the first scan, but the pregnancy resulted in a live birth. And the highest beta HCG in a singleton pregnancy that resulted in a live birth, but had a pregnancy of unknown location at the first scan was 4,600. So they decided that the 2000 thing was way, way too um, aggressive and that we should not use that. Um, I think my slides are on some automatic roll through. Um, so my residents argue with me, well, there's no point in doing a scan. We're not gonna see anything if the beta HCG is, you know, whatever number. That's not a good argument. And if they start doing that to you when you're on call, you need to tell me. What the beta HCG does is it confirms that there is trophoblastic tissue in that woman's body. And it gives us a starting point to track to see if it goes up or goes down. The other thing that you need to be aware of is that in a series, again, from Brigham and Women's, 72 patients with a beta HCG less than 500 had um, confirmed ectopic pregnancies. And of those, seven, so 10% of ectopic pregnancies with a beta less than 500 were ruptured. So there is no beta HCG that can tell you I should scan for an ectopic, I should be concerned about rupture. None of those work. There is no discriminatory beta HCG. It merely tells you the patient is pregnant and the follow-up will tell you whether the patient remains pregnant or the pregnancy has failed. Um, this is an honest to God paper from PubMed. The morphological ultrasound types known as blob and bagel should be reclassified from probable to definite ectopic pregnancy. You'll see that's from 2017. And I have to say, I agree with that because the current nomenclature that's used is that if there is a hemorrhagic mass or a ring, we're supposed to say probable ectopic and only call a definite ectopic when we see a sac with a yolk sac or an embryo. And if you remember, that was only about 15% sensitive. So I'll leave you with this happy image of the blob versus the bagel sign. And I'm gonna give you a second to catch your breath and then we'll go through questions and we'll do the answers. So everybody stretch and I hope you were paying attention. The first question is why is the concept of pregnancy of unknown location important? Why do I care so much about that? And why did I say that it is an observation and not a diagnosis? There are your answer options. And we'll go through all the questions and then I'll come back and discuss the answers. Next question. In a patient with a positive pregnancy test, an intrauterine smooth walled anechoic cystic structure, i.e. something round or oval, and no adnexal mass, what is the probability that that represents an intrauterine pregnancy? Is it very high? Is it very low? Question number three, normal structures in early pregnancy. There's something in here between the calipers. Is that the chorion? Is it the amnion? Is it the embryo? Or is it the yolk sac? And it's important when you look at early pregnancies and you're doing measurements that you know what it is you're measuring. Because if you're going to date a pregnancy based on ultrasound, you better be measuring the right thing. Here's early pregnancy and determining which of your twins you're going to look after yourself and which you're going to send off to see the MFM docs. What kind of pregnancy is this? Is it dizygotic, dichorionic, monochorionic, or monoamniotic? And last but not least, what is the most common appearance of a tubal ectopic pregnancy with modern equipment? Is it an inhomogeneous solid mass, a simple adnexal cyst, a sac which contains an embryo, or a dilated fallopian tube? And we'll go back and start um, on the answers now. Does anybody have any questions before we go through the answers? <laughs> 
dead silence from the crowd. All right. Why is the concept of pregnancy of unknown location important? Because 11 to 15% of them will be diagnosed as ectopic pregnancy. So the correct answer is C. And like I said, people with a pregnancy of unknown location, you cannot assume that they have miscarried. You have to worry that it could be an ectopic pregnancy. These are the women that go on the ectopic pregnancy watch list, have their serial beta HCG at 48 hours and onwards, and have a follow-up ultrasound if it increases so we can decide where the pregnancy is. Here's your statistical probability and likelihood from the IUP side. So we said if you have a smooth round or oval structure in the uterus, you should assume it is an IUP. And particularly if it's in the uterus and there is no adnexal mass, you've looked very carefully to make sure there's not something sitting out there that could be an ectopic pregnancy. The statistical likelihood of an IUP at that point was 99.98%. So the correct answer is D, because they tell us when we write questions that you can't make things look different. So I just said 95%. In other words, if you see a round or oval fluid collection in the uterus, nothing in the adnexa, positive pregnancy test, you're almost certainly looking at an IUP. Whether or not it's viable will yet to be determined. What is the structure between the calipers? The correct answer here is the embryo, option C. This is the chorion that's gonna grow up to be the placenta. This is the amnion, which would separate it from its neighbor if it was a diamniotic twin. And this is the embryo. And the crown rump length of the embryo is what determines the size in early pregnancy. I asked you what time of twin pregnancy that was, and it's kind of a bit mean, but remember I did say for a dizygotic pregnancy, the only way we can diagnose that on ultrasound is if we see different fetal sexes, then we know there had to be two separate ova fertilized. Here we have one thick ring and one thick ring, so this is a dichorionic pregnancy, which you can definitively diagnose in the first trimester. If it were monochorionic, both embryos would be inside the thick membrane, and if it was monoamniotic, both embryos would be inside one amnion, inside one chorion. So this is the type of twins that you want to have if you're going to have twins because you have no placental sharing and you have the highest likelihood of getting two live babies out of a pregnancy that is dichorionic. Last question was, what is the most common appearance of a tubal ectopic pregnancy? And as we talked about the blob and the bagel signs, the inhomogeneous solid mass is the commonest sign that we see nowadays. A simple adnexal cyst is not going to be an ectopic. It's almost certainly going to be either a follicle in the ovary or something like a paratubal cyst. A sac with an embryo is seen in less than 10% of modern series of ectopic pregnancies. And a dilated fallopian tube is a risk factor for ectopic pregnancies. If you have hydrosalpinx, you're at increased risk, but it is not a sign of the ectopic pregnancy itself. So that is all I have to say to you guys. I'm gonna switch off the recording.